My name is Angelo and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Shanghai, UFC Vegas 83 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and bets. If you don't know, this was supposed to be in Shanghai and then for reasons undisclosed, they moved it to Vegas. Now we have a handful of fights that were out of nowhere, complete last minute slap togethers because when they moved it from Shanghai to Vegas, they lost three or four fights from the road to the UFC guys. Either way, I'm breaking down this entire card and I will give you all the things. I'm also trying to give you $1,000. We are doing a $1,000 giveaway. It is completely free to enter. You literally click two buttons and write one comment and you can win $1,000. Here's the conditions. If the We Want Picks YouTube channel hits 20,000 subscribers and the Picks Nation YouTube channel hits 10,000 subscribers, we're giving away the money. If you're a regular person walking the streets, living your life, we will send you $500. If you're that same regular person walking the streets, but you happen to be a premium member, we will give you $1,000. We will double it. We take care of our premium members. We will double that money. I am not worried about the We Want Chicks channel. We Want Chicks. Hey, Jacob. The We Want Picks channel getting to 20,000 subscribers. We may do that before this weekend. It's the Picks Nation side of the house that needs a little bit more love. The links to all of that is below. You literally just click the subscribe button. That's it. And then comment on the giveaway video because we're going to use a random comment picker to pick the winner. $1,000 to get you there if you're a premium member. $500 if you are not. But I recommend becoming a premium member because it's going to get you far more than just doubling your money on a giveaway. It's also going to get you the safety parlay. Listen. The safety part of they broke last night. All right, we were on a nice little streak. It broke. This is the exact moment. You're actually looking at the exact moment that everything left my body and I hated myself for picking Zachary's. This is the moment that Cody Brundage decided to just caveman his way, rampage Jackson his way out of a triangle and win that fight. It was uh, frustrating. It was annoying. Let me paint you a picture. I'm sitting upstairs. It is very rare that I get to watch these midday fight cards, right? I've got two kids. We've got birthday parties and sports and all sorts of my wife plans crap. We have all sorts of stuff going on. I finally get to watch one. We don't have any birthday parties. We don't have any nonsense. It's actually kind of a cloudy day. I'm in the media room. We're good to go. Fight started at three. And I was like, you know what? I looked around. I go, Tiff, we got anything going on today? She said, no. I said, I'm going to have a couple of drinks. I got myself a whole, we had a 12 pack of Angry Orchards. And don't make fun of me. Those things are delicious. And I could have been some weirdo drinking Aperol. I was drinking Angry Orchards. It's cold outside, all the things. And I got angry. It was as advertised. I thought Zach Reese was going to smoke Cody Brunich. And not because Cody wasn't talented. I said for a week how talented he is. But because he just finds ways to lose fights. And I thought he was going to find a way. I, he was in that triangle. I'm like, well, Cody's the most submittable guy in the division. What about? Boom. Either way, very, very frustrating. We want the safety parlay to hit. It has become part of my like self-worth at this point. When that safety parlay hits, it directly affects me, my mood, everything. It's not just like, eh, we move on. No, I care about that thing. It's my third kid. But I will say the safety parlay continues to be a success. You can't win them all. This is the most volatile sport in the world to bet on. It just is. It is a fist fight and anything can happen. Look at Ihor Paterio versus Badlato. Look at that fight. Badlato was 99% out, didn't go out, and then like it's crazy. This is a wild sport and that is why we love it. But the safety parlay continues to be a success. We hit four of the last six events. The average monthly unit net profit is 1.579 units and the event profitability is 70.45%. So more than 70% of the events that we do a safety parlay for, which is all of them, it hits or you end up with profit. So if you just signed up for premium membership yesterday and the only thing you did was a safety parlay, yeah, it missed. And that sucks. But I promise you the long-term success is there. So become a premium member now to unlock the safety parlay. You're also gonna get so much more. It's only $10 a month. Go to wewantpicks.com click become a member at the top. You're also going to get the line movement tracker and other tools. And I will emphasize the tools here. The tools are incredibly important. It's easy for anybody to be like, mm, here's a couple of my bets. 
It's very hard for people to provide actual value. And these tools do that for you. One of the tools is the line movement tracker. This is gonna give you the opening odds, the current odds, and the win probability for every single fighter on every single card. Let's take a look at Khalil Roundtree. Open as a plus 210 underdog in his new co-main event slot. He is now a minus 225 favorite. That is 114% line movement. That is a wild swing. He is the biggest mover on the card. Two fighters on this card flipped from underdog to favorite. Six fighters have had 20% line movement or more. You're also going to get the detailed data metrics and analytics. This is 38 columns of information that's going to help you find your spots or potentially help you avoid losing spots. There are people out there in the world selling a spreadsheet similar to this for $10 by itself. This is included in everything we do because I am here building the greatest value in this space. I could spend 30 minutes and actually there is a 30 minute video walking through everything in premium. It is all $10 and we continue to add week in and week out, month in and month out to make it the greatest value of all time. You're also going to get the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. A lot of you don't play DraftKings Fantasy, but millions of people do. And this is just another offering that we have. DraftKings Fantasy, you get a budget, you build a lineup, you use that lineup to compete against other people, and you could be competing for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we have the best ownership projections in the game. These numbers are insanely important. And this half a percentage point difference between us and the rest of the world is also insanely important because that information goes into our optimizer. The optimizer then builds lineups for you and it helps you find your spots. It helps build what you need to go out there and win some money. This is just one of the many, many things included with premium membership. Wewantpicks.com. Click become a member. It is only $10 a month. I can't emphasize that enough. One of you right now is watching this with a bagel and a coffee and you spent more than $10 and that's for seven minutes of enjoyment and then God knows how long on the toilet because of that coffee. $10 a month gets you everything you have ever needed at wewantpicks.com. Just click become a member at the top. Now that you've done the thing that costs money, become a premium member, let's do a couple of the free things. Follow our socials. We are on literally every single platform. We stream live to not only YouTube, but also Kick and Twitch. We have two YouTube channels. We're on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and the Discord is 100% free. You can join the Discord for nothing. If you're a premium member, you unlock a whole bunch of channels and other information, but the actual Discord itself is free. Do all of those things. The link to do everything is in the description of our YouTube videos. And finally, if you want to send us something, send us some mail. If you guys don't know, I film a Fight Foods vlog. It is a vlog for every single pay-per-view. Last time we went hunting, cooked some good food, watched the fights. Every time we do something interesting, but we open the mail. Last time, somebody decided that they hated my digestive tract. So they sent what was probably the hottest hot sauce on the planet, and it destroyed me. But it was sent, so I opened it. And I tried it. If you want to send something, I, I beg you, please don't send something that will destroy me physically. Here's the address. P.O. Box 406 in good old Prosper, Texas. Let's go ahead and break down this card. What I will say before I dig into this fight and the 11 others after it, listen to the words that I'm saying, not necessarily the actions that I'm doing. And I'm saying that because inevitably, this is what happens. Let me walk you through what happens. Inevitably, I do all my research. I do all the graphics. I'm a full week ahead, sometimes two weeks ahead on the events. So I do all my research a week ahead of time. I do my bets a week ahead of time. I do the graphics. I do all of that. My initial bets, I don't know what the percentage is, but my initial bets hit at a very high percentage. Last week, I went two and one on my initial bets. I had Drakkar Close. I had Veronica Hardy. And then I missed the Kelvin Gastelum. Fine. Two and one, very profitable. Veronica Hardy was a solid plus 120 underdog. And then Drakkar Close, I think, was like minus 120, something to that effect. But then what happens is I break down the card. I'll say things like, I think Wellington Terman wins this fight. But Wellington Terman is not a guy that you can trust in your parlay. I say that. I say it to you. I say it in this video. It's in my notes. It's on the website. I say that. And then Thursday comes around. Friday comes around. I'm like, man, I don't have enough bets to put together a betting video. I don't have enough bets to really push this. Let me find some other spots. And then I force myself into things that I wasn't 
initially happy about. Meaning, I took Wellington Terman and I put his dumb ass in a parlay and I knew I shouldn't have. Sunday, Angelo recording a quick fix video is like, hey, dummy, you can't trust this guy. Look at him. And then Friday, Angelo is like, hey, we're feeling good. I broke down this card three times. Yeah, Jacob is right. Wellington's going to destroy this guy. And then I do that dumb shit. So either way, listen to the things that I'm saying. Don't, not, you know, the things I do matter, but the things I say, if you see me go against myself, just know I'm being an idiot. It's just that simple. Opening up. The UFC Vegas 83 fight card. We have Daniel Marcos taking on Carlos Ferra. This fight was literally announced, I don't know, 10 hours ago. But I did the research. We put it together and we're going to break it down. Daniel Marcos is undefeated. He is stepping up on insanely short notice. I am filming this Sunday morning at 6.22 a.m. And he got the call probably yesterday. They announced it yesterday. So he's got to get to Vegas. He's got to get out there, get ready, start cutting weight. This is at a catch weight. They are both 135 pounders. This is at 140 pounds. Daniel Marcos is a pretty good striker. He's got some power and he's very accurate. He does a nice job stringing together combinations. He does a nice job marching forward. He'll throw one twos. He'll follow up with flying knees, elbows. His takedown defense is a very solid 89%. And with eight knockouts and seven decisions, you know that he's dangerous and that he has the cardio to continue to fight for a full 15 minutes. He's coming off that decision win over Davey Grant, where yes, he won, but he just did not do enough and he was pretty low volume. He's taking on Carlos Vera. This guy was on the Ultimate Fighter, but this is his official UFC debut. He's a short, thick guy. He's very athletic. He moves pretty well. He has a loose striking style where he has constant movement and a ton of kicks. He's well-rounded enough. You're going to see him strike. He'll have some success. You'll see him wrestle. He'll have some success. And you'll see him grapple. That's probably his strongest asset. His takedowns and hips aren't great, though. So he somehow initiates takedown exchanges, and then he's going to end up on his back or end up in a bad scramble that he doesn't want to be in. He does have aggressive BJJ off of his back, and he'll roll for anything he can find. He is at Ryan Hall's fight camp. He will play those BJJ nerd games, which you hate to see. On his feet, though, he's going to wing some punches. He's going to throw. He's going to be creative. I don't know if he's a capoeira fighter, but he has sort of that style, and I've you know, when I do my research, it's not just watch tape. I'm also Googling and diving in. And I saw people talking about he's doing capoeira seminars. So he might have that style as well, but the constant movement, the constant spinning and things of that nature can throw people off and he can have sort of a tricky stand-up style. On the ground, he's going to hunt. He's going to hunt, he's going to chase, and sometimes it's going to work out for him and sometimes it is not. He's coming off that loss on the ultimate fighter house to the eventual winner, Brad Katona. This, I mentioned, is insanely short notice. Both of these guys stepping up on, what, four days? Tuesdays are the day that they fly out. So if they're not already in Vegas, they found out probably on Saturday that this is 100% booked. By Tuesday, they will be flying to Las Vegas. And it's just weight cut. Basically, whoever was already the lightest should be in the better position here as far as what the rest of this week looks like. Carlos Vera was already scheduled to fight. Not in the UFC, a local promotion. So he was in a camp of sorts doing the things he was supposed to do. I didn't see that Daniel Marcos was scheduled anywhere. So I imagine he wasn't. And he just somehow got this short notice call up. It's the end of the year. Let me get a paycheck before the holidays or whatever it is. Daniel Marcos should win this fight though. But if he fights Carlos Vera. So if Daniel Marcos is tired, has too much weight to cut, all of those things, right? That come with a short notice fight. And he fights like how he fought Davy Grant. He actually could be in a little bit of trouble here because Carlos Vera will come forward. He'll push a pace. He'll swing wild. Yeah, he'll flop around. He'll roll around on his back like a toddler. The Ryan Halls of the world. But he's still kind of a dangerous guy. I do think Daniel Marcos wins. I think the length, the reach, all of those things. The stats say it's about even, but I promise you when they are next to each other, it is not even. I think Daniel Marcos is going to be too good of a striker. Carlos' takedowns are a little too sloppy. And I think Daniel could absolutely win this fight. I don't know if I'm going to do anything with it just yet. Maybe I'll wait for the odds. We don't have odds yet. It's that new. I'll wait for the odds. If Daniel's a, a favorite, but like it's a reasonable number, I may do something. But if he's a minus 600 favorite because he's undefeated, then no, I'm not going to touch it. Anyway, Daniel Marcos is going to be the pick. I think he's the better all-around fighter, but we could have a weird situation because of the short notice. Then we have Rayan Dos Santos taking on Talita Alencar. Talita Talita, Talita, get over here. What are you doing over there, Talita? I don't know why I insisted on saying it that way. Rayan Santos, 
pretty robust career here. 14 and 6 versus 4 and 0. That is a wild difference in experience levels. But Rian DeSantos, also, if you're doing your own research, she'll be known as Rian Amanda, I, which I don't know why. There's like, yeah, first name, middle name. That's what we'll call her. She's an aggressive grappler. She's got some fluid striking. Her striking is busy. She's very light on her feet. She's got that constant movement and activity. She does not get overly aggressive with her wrestling, but when she does get it to the ground, she's got a great balance of ground and pound as well as positions and then submissions. So she does a really good job of hitting you and then establishing where she is. She'll hit you a little more and then she'll work to something. She's not just like raining down or only grappling. She does a nice healthy balance of what she's doing when it gets to the ground. She will keep pressure. She will stay busy and she will look for those submissions. Takedown defense is solid as well. I saw more than one fight where people would shoot a takedown on her and not only would she stuff it the way you're supposed to stuff it, but she would reverse it, look to spin and do all of those things and she'll turn a takedown from you into a takedown of her own. She's taking on Toledo Alicar. And she's not like some Southern hick, so I don't know why I'm doing that with my accent. But anyway, Talita is an accomplished grappler. She's 4-0 in MMA, but she has a long, actually 4-0-1 in MMA, but she has a long career uh, in the grappling world. She transitioned to MMA about two years ago, two and a half years ago. She comes out guns blazing. She will chase takedowns, and she's going to look to get it to the ground immediately. Once she does get it to the ground, she's busy with her striking, and she actually goes there long before looking for a submission. She will actually ground and pound far more than she will chase the sub, even though she's such an accomplished judo, judo, jujitsu practitioner. Mostly looking for control and the ground and pound, not chasing submissions. Her takedowns are not great. In fact, she went four for 24 on the contender series. That's a lot. That is a lot of attempts and a very, very low hit rate. And she relies on her strength, though. She is pretty strong. She will come forward. She'll have sort of those trash entries, but she can push you around, muscle you, and try to drag you to the ground. Striking is not very good either. So if she can't get it to the ground, she's always going to be at a disadvantage. If she can get it to the ground or if she can get you to the cage, she's got the size, she's got the strength, and obviously on the ground, she has the skill sets to do it. I hate to just sort of immediately be two favorites in. Right, especially after what we just saw at UFC Austin, there was 12 fights, right? There, yeah, there was 12 fights and I think six underdogs won. Yeah, six underdogs won. So half the card, the underdogs won. We're two fights in, I'm going two favorites here. And then, you know, the reality is you just gotta break it down and then go for it. When I do my research, when I break down the fights, when I make my picks, I don't know the odds. I purposely don't look at the odds because I do find that that will sway you. So I don't look at the odds, and then when I'm done, I will go look at the odds to be like, oh, should I bet on this person? So I broke this down not knowing what they would say, right? They might be like, well, Rayanne is a grappler. Talit is the far more accomplished grappler. Talit is the favorite. Now, Rayanne is the favorite, and I think she should be. I think DeSantos is going to win this fight. Alan Carr is going to need to get it to the ground. DeSantos has that really nice takedown defense. She's also a solid grappler herself, so if she does get to the ground... She should be able to defend herself, survive, and work her way out of trouble. On the feet, Dos Santos is going to have a ma just light years ahead. A massive advantage on the feet. And her takedown defense should hold up. She should cruise to a decision. So Ryan Dos Santos is going to be the pick. But, you know, we have debuting fighters with wildly different experience levels here. So I don't know if I'm going to bet on it. But Ryan Dos Santos, Ryan Do Amanda Dos Santos is the pick. Then we have Stephanie Egger taking on Luana Santos. Stephanie Egger is a solid grappler. She is a judoka. She's got a nice judo background, good judo trips, takedowns, throws, and she mostly sets those up against the cage. Once she does get the takedown, she's going to settle in and look for a submission. She's a very inactive fighter on the feet. You can see she's landing fewer than two significant strikes per minute. If she cannot get the takedown, she does not have much to offer. She is coming off that quick loss to Arena Alex Skiva, where she was knee barred standing in under three minutes. It was also her only UFC fight where she did not have an offensive takedown. You can't really hold that against her. I mean, she literally had Arena's back on the feet. It was very early. Look, oh, this might go well. And then, I mean, very high risk, high reward move for Arena. It ended up working out. But if it didn't work out, it would have been like, what is this idiot doing right now? But it did work out. Taking on Luena Santo. She's a very slick grappler. She's got her own nice judo throw. She's got control before working to submissions when it's on the ground. She's patient on top. She does an amazing job of maintaining those positions after getting takedowns. She does not have the best striking. 
And she does rely very heavily on her judo, but she has no problem getting into a slug fight. And I'm going to address the slug fight thing. I say slug fight on the live stream with Jacob. And then he's like, oh, two slugs. And then I backed. I was like, no, I didn't say slug fight. I said slug fest. But no, it is slug fight. If me and you are slugging it out, is that not a slug fight? Well, and then I made the mistake of Googling slug fight, thinking I was going to prove a point. An urban dictionary says it's something entirely different. But slug fight feels like a natural thing to say. Anyway, Luana Santos will stand there and bomb away with another person slugging it out in a fight, even though she's a grappler. And she's coming off that win over the incredibly talented, the incredibly tough, the incredibly skilled Juliana Miller. That was a phone booth fight, bit of a slug fight, if you will. This is Judoka versus Judoka, essentially, right? One's 35, the other one's 26. One's willing to slug it out on their feet, and the other averages fewer than two significant strikes per minute. I've got to go Luana here, and while everyone likes to say, don't bet women's MMA, this is a hard one not to bet. Yes, Stephanie is a tough veteran at this point, but Luana is dangerous on the feet. On the ground, she's got a danger. In the clinch, she's got some danger. Luana's the pick. Uh, I'm going to talk to myself in the mirror for a good... 20, 30 minutes, try to keep myself from betting on this because, I mean, it is a stronger, older veteran woman taking on sort of a young, fast, flashy up-and-comer. And that doesn't always go well for the up-and-comer, but Santos should win this. Hopefully, I can convince myself not to bet on it. So Santos is going to be the pick, and I'm sure you'll see a bet from me on the Friday Best Bets video. Some of you wondering, hey, where did the Best Bets, where did the best bets video go? It's on Picks Nation. It's on our other YouTube channel. I saw a few people come. Oh, I miss it. I miss it. It's on that channel. Same exact video getting uploaded. We put it there because we're trying to grow that channel as well. So that $1,000 giveaway, if you remember, you need to subscribe to. I don't know why I'm doing all this weird voice stuff today. Watch a Pixar movie. If you remember, we're doing a $1,000 giveaway. We need this channel. We want Picks to get to 20,000 subscribers and our other channel to get to 10. The other channels where the best bets video are. So click the damn button. It costs nothing. Half a second of work. Then we have the rebooked, the moved. Steve Garcia versus Milk Costa. I'm going to ask you a favor. I don't know why this was moved. They said reasons undisclosed. And it was before the weigh-ins that this fight was canceled. So if somebody knows why, not don't. Don't project, don't guess. If somebody actually knows why, did one of them have a weight cut issue? Was there a medical, like I, what was the issue that this was rebooked? Frankly, conspiracy theory me is like, <laughs> UFC realized that this Vegas 83 card had 10 fights on it. And they're like, eh, we gotta move some shit. And actually it only had nine fights on it earlier in the week till they moved Khalil Roundtree. So I think they moved it. I think they literally offered him some money and moved it. But there may have been an actual issue because if Mel Costa, for example, this is, I don't know if this is true, I'm just saying this. If Mel Costa, for example, was struggling and wasn't going to make weight and the UFC was like, hey, we'll just move it to next week, you get a little more time. Well, that, that changes things a little bit, doesn't it? So if you know why this was moved from UFC Austin to UFC Vegas 83, let me know. That will matter. And I will talk about that on the Tuesday stream, actually the Monday stream. We're doing it Monday instead this week because I got to travel. But let's break this down anyway. Steve Garcia, Mel Costa. Steve Garcia, guy's a good grappler. He's got some good takedowns, but he also has powerful, powerful hands, and he is a dog. He should primarily be a grappler. That is actually his skill set. But over time, he's developed some power. He's a, an absolute man. He's not going to quit. He's not going to back down from a fight. He's going to come forward. He's going to bomb away. Is his chin going to hold up? I don't know. It doesn't always. He drops. And yeah, he recovers well, but he drops. But he will stay in your face. He will bomb away. He does have power. And he'll shoot takedowns. The accuracy is only 44%, but his takedown defense is incredible. His takedown average is a little more than one and a half per 15 minutes. So he's coming forward. He's bombing. He's staying in your face. And if you give him space, if you're backing up, he will walk you down and he will bomb away. He's taking on Mel Costa. This guy is, I don't want to say the opposite of Steve Garcia because Steve Garcia is not the most technical guy in the world, but he's tough. He'll come forward. He'll do something. 
Mel Costa is actually incredibly technical. He's precise. He's a well-rounded guy. His striking is creative. He's got some solid grappling as well. And he'll piece you apart. He will land where he's supposed to land, when he's supposed to land. He will be technical, accurate, and do all of those things. And then he'll grapple. I'd argue he should not He should not be grappling as much as he does. Steve Garcia should grapple more because his chin. Mel Costa should be grappling less because his striking is so good. If you look at his last fight, he kept baiting Austin Lingo into the fight. He would bang, 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 and then shoot. Why are you shooting? You lit him up. And this breakdown is exactly the same as it was last week. I think that Mel Costa's ability to bait Steve Garcia into a slug fight will be a problem for Steve Garcia. We see him get chinned a little bit. Has he been knocked out? No, not recently. He outdogged Chepe Mariscal, so we know this guy's an animal. But he does get wobbled. He does drop a little bit. And yes, he recovers, but eventually he's not going to recover. I think Mel Costa can bait Steve Garcia, plant, and throw. Steve Garcia was a very solid underdog last week. He remains a very solid underdog, but we need to know why this was rescheduled because he's either an even better underdog or should be the favorite. Everything's circumstantial. Let me know in the comments if you know why the hell this fight was moved and what changed. Then we have Song Kanan taking on Kevin Jusset. I will tell you, I saw on the Discord last night, I was in the Discord last night with my angry orchards being very angry and people were talking about, first of all, I, listen, I'm 40. All right, that's also why I have nice things and I have a family. I'm an adult with a good job and I contribute to society. This is not my parents' home. This is not a basement. I wash my own clothes. I have a wife. She's a little mean, but she's pretty. Anyway, I was in the Discord. I thought, what the hell was, how does that even relate to this? I was in the Discord and I was watching people talk. You know, UFC Austin's over. Now people are trying to find their spots in the next card, obviously. That's why these videos do well. I'm early. And people were talking about Song Kanan, free money. I hate that saying. I hate the free money saying. And it's always, it's always something with you kids. Fraud checked. Free money. I hate it. I don't know. Saying free money is just so annoying. And then there's always a couple of turds that change their username to like, I guarantee some idiot. And I'm sorry if you're the idiot. Some idiot is going to have the screen name Kanan free money. That's going to be their screen name in the Discord. Join the Discord. It's free and make sure that person knows that's stupid. I hate the saying free money. And it's especially in the song Kanan is not free money. He had some success against Ian Gary and then that was the end of it. Yes, he's a powerful striker, but his wrestling sucks. He does have one punch power. He does not have the cleanest technique. He can be beat with pressure and control. If you give him space, he's going to throw heavy. He's going to touch you up. You're going to have some trouble. Takedown defense, not very good. Zero percent. It is not very good. He does remain composed. He does work back to his feet where he is taken down, and then he's comfortable. He hits hard. As I mentioned, we saw in the Ian Gary fight, he hits very hard. He smoked that fool. He dropped that dude like a bag of sand off of a roof. But Ian Gary put it together, shook it off, and then finished Song Kanan. And then if you remember, Song had some really low fight IQ moves in that fight. He was winning the straight. He almost had Ian Gary out cold. And then he decided to grapple for no reason whatsoever. That's the guy that people in the Discord are calling free money. He did just come off that decision win over Rolando Bedoya, Bedoya, where he showcased his power, but he was low volume. That it was a very simple jack of me. Taking on Kevin Jose. Kevin Jose is a stocky striker. He plots forward. He's got low hands, low volume. When he does finally close that distance, he likes to work you to the cage for control and takedowns. He is insanely patient. Everything he does. He takes his time and he tries to do it right. He does use his size to slow things down. His takedowns are slow. His striking is slow, but he is huge for this weight class. He's very strong and he knows how to use that size advantage. He's coming off that successful UFC debut where he just physically dominated Kiefer Crosby. Kanan is dangerous in this fight. He's dangerous in every fight that he's ever going to be in. He has the power to end a fight at any moment, but I think that's where his chances end here. I think he is sort of one punch or bust in this fight specifically. Kevin's takedowns are going to be the biggest advantage here. He should be able to push forward, close the distance, avoid the power, and then take Kanan down whenever he wants to. Kevin's the pick. I'm actually more confident in him than his minus 185 odds. I think minus 185 is good. 
I, th- I think Kevin said with the takedowns, with the pressure, the physical advantages that he has, I think that's going to matter a lot. I think he's going to just bully Song Kanan and get this done. Also, there's like a trend recently in the YouTube sec- comment section talking about Angelo bullies Jacob. What? First of all, I could break that twerp's neck whenever I want to. Second of all, we are actually fighting February 9th. If you guys didn't know that, we are fighting on February 9th. We're figuring out the logistics, if we're going to live stream it, all those things. So you'll find out just how slight and delicate that young man is. Second of all, he's the bully. I'm over here running this business, putting out good content, trying to talk, and he jumps in with his outlandish stuff. He's the bully. I'm not the bully. I'm sticking up for myself, and we're all going to find out on February 9th. Kevin is a bully. And he is going to bully Song into a win. Then we have Tatsuro Taira taking on Carlos Hernandez. I'm surprised Tatsuro is this low on the card. This order isn't finalized yet, but typically you know who's on the main card and who isn't. I'm surprised Tatsuro is not loaded up on the main card. This kid is an undefeated prospect in a market that they're trying to grow and expand. Anyway, Tatsuro is taking on Carlos Hernandez. Tatsuro Taira does remain undefeated. He is one of the best flyweight prospects in the world right now. And I know that sounds dramatic, but he just did. He just continues to win. He continues to do what he needs to do. He's only 23 years old. He's got 14 fights with 11 finishes. Style-wise, he's a patient striker. Decent power, nothing crazy, but very strong grappling. He does not have the best takedowns in the division, but he's going to stick with him. He's going to drag you to the ground. He is coming off that humbling win over short-notice Edgar Chárez where he was definitely in trouble more than once. I say humbling win, because he did win, but like, man, he should have won a little differently than that. He's taking on Carlos Hernandez. This guy is a grappler. He's got some okay striking. Striking-wise, solid accuracy and deceiving power. He's not the most technically sound guy, but he's got a nice jab with a straight that follows. He's another one of these guys that's got slick BJJ, but not the wrestling to get it to the ground. He's going to take shots, but they're usually stuffed, and then he ends up working for the upper body. He's been known to throw up a Hail Mary submission or two, like some flying triangles. He's coming off that decision win over Dennis Bandar where he controlled the striking, but only went two for seven on takedown attempts. Tatsuro's betting line is is pretty juiced, right? He's minus 500. I think that's where it should be. Yeah, we just saw him in a whole bunch of trouble with Edgar Chárez, but Carlos isn't as dangerous of a striker or as dangerous of a grappler as Edgar is. Carlos is tough, but he's very likely going to be taken down, potentially submitted here. I am very confident in Tatsuro. I think he moves to 15-0. and 0. And uh, I'm waiting for props and stuff like that to see what else we can get going here. Minus 500 doesn't seem that crazy to me for Tatsuro Taira in this matchup. Then we have another minus 500 favorite. We have Hung Sung Park taking on Shannon Ross. Hung Sung Park is a very slick grappler. He has one single game plan in mind. Plot forward, find the opening, get it to the ground. He is a finisher. He snatches things up very quickly. He is patient on his feet. And then he finds his openings, closes the distance, and works in a takedown. He is very dangerous. But the more tape you watch, the more you can see how hum- how uncomfortable he can be on his feet. You look a little closer. He's backing up. He's turning his head. He does not love standing up and getting in those striking exchanges. But he's a very, very slick, opportunistic grappler. And he's coming off that late submission win in what was a very close fight where he was knocked down and then won one, went, I need to reboot here, went one four three in takedown attempts. This is how Cody Brundage could murder. Taking on Shannon Ross. This guy's a pretty well-rounded guy. And while his primary discipline is wrestling, he does get sucked into back and forth firefights, which can be a problem because he's a little bit chinny. He comes forward. He does put on that volume. He throws with intent, but he gets hit a lot. So he's a busy guy who fights hard, has solid takedowns, is willing to trade, but again, he's insanely hittable. He's explosive, dangerous, never been in a boring fight. He is winless in the UFC coming off his third straight finish loss. I just broke down Tatsuro Taira, and I mentioned he was appropriately priced at minus 500. Park is also minus 500-ish. And while Shannon Ross is one and four in his last five, I don't think Park is safe let alone at that, at those odds. 
We just watched him get dropped in his last fight. And yes, Shannon Ross is chinny and finishable himself, but he's also tough. He's a wrestler. He's willing to nut up and fight like a man. Park should win. If he doesn't get it to the ground early, though, there may be some issues. He could have a very long night. Park's going to be the pick, but I'm not... This, this, this is the moment. Hold me accountable to this moment. I am saying Park should win this fight, but he should not be bet on, especially not at these odds. I said the exact same thing about Wellington Terman last week. And then the week went on and I still bet on that idiot. Do not let me bet on Park. If I bet on Park and you see him in a parlay or some stupid shit like that, I recommend you unsubscribe and comment unsubscribing because of Park. I need to be held accountable. I can't, uh, this is like an actual, like I'm looking at him, this is a revelation. I can't force myself into things because I feel like I don't have enough money going on a card. If I didn't do that, I would have been profitable last night at UFC Austin. UFC Austin, my initial bets, boom. Veronica Hardy, plus 120, hit. Boom. Drakkar Close, hit. Lost the Kelvin one, fine. But those three bets are my initial. These two, far more than covered this one. And I was up money. And then I... Uh, through Wellington Terminator and Parlay. Anyway, Park should win. Don't trust this guy with your money. Do not trust this guy with your money. Yeah, the easy way to look at the, oh, Shannon Ross, one in four, three fight. No. Do not trust Park with your money just yet. Too unproven at this time. Then we have somewhat of a proven entity, Nazrat Hakparas, taking on Jamie Malarkey. Both of these guys have been around for a while. Both of these guys have been in a bunch of fights. Both of these guys have had mixed success. Nazrat Hakparas, is a solid striker. He's got high volume. He lands almost six significant strikes per minute with a very good 78% takedown defense. When he can push the pace and find a rhythm, he's a very hard guy to beat. But if you stay busy and you stay in his face, like Bobby Green did, you can have success. He's coming off that decision win over UFC newcomer, Landon Akeen Jonas. He's taking on Jamie Malarkey. This guy's a pretty well-rounded guy. He can wrestle with more than two takedowns per fight. He can strike with two knockout wins in the UFC, but he's not great anywhere. He's a well-rounded guy. He's tough, but he's not dangerous. You're going to see some not... He's not dangerous. Primarily a grappler, but he has been a busy striker in the last couple of years. He's coming off that close decision win over John McDessey. This might upset a few people, but I don't think Nazrat is who we were hoping he would be. At one point, he was a pretty touted prospect who could strike, he could wrestle, but now he seems to be a decision machine who sort of lost that edge. He's coming off a decision over UFC newcomer where he went 0 for 5 on takedown attempts. Is he good enough to beat Jamie Malarkey? Maybe. Should he be a 2 to 1 favorite over Jamie Malarkey? No. Jamie is exactly the type of busy striker with forward pressure that could steal a decision here. The pick is probably going to be Nasrat because I think he's a little bit better everywhere. Takedown defense is incredible. He's got a high volume striking. But the bet might be on Jamie Malarkey plus three and a half. I could absolutely see this being a 29-28 across the board. If you think that this could be a split decision, uh, here's the, the three things that you factor in if you want to place one of these plus three and a half bets one is do you think it could be a split decision if so well plus three and a half on a big underdog may be worth it do you think your fighter can lose a 29 28 decision can they win one single round if you think so great betting the underdog might be a good move and three do you think your fighter can just outright win if so plus three and a half is a solid bet I'm probably going to do that. We'll see what the odds are. As long as Nazrat is a two to one favorite here, we may be able to get some plus money on that plus three and a half. If you're not a premium member, please become one. A couple of things. One, it's only $10 a month. Two, it supports the channel. Like everything we, nothing is free. The camera, the software I'm using, nothing is free. That premium money helps keep things going. It runs this business. And three, you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff, including the premium channels in Discord. Discord is free, but we do have what we call premium alert channels so that the very second I place a bet, the very second Jacob places a bet, you're going to get alerted to that. Later today, this is Sunday, depending when you're watching this, this is Sunday morning. Later today, Jacob's going to be finalizing his picks, his bets, and they're just going to be flowing in that premium alerts channel, and you're going to get all those alerts on your phone. So you can go watch football, do your thing, 
You're going to get your alert. Oh, the, here's all of Jacob's picks. Okay, here's all of his bets. And then if you like one, you grab it. If you don't, you move on. If you're not a premium member, you have to wait till whenever the hell he gives you those picks and he's not going to give you the bets. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's only $10 a month. $10 for an entire month. And we always have... There's a sales pitch. You guys get it. Jamie Malarkey, plus three and a half. We'll see when those odds drop. Typically on a Tuesday, maybe on a Monday. As soon as we see those, if I like it, I'll hit it and you will get the alert on your phone. Then we have a Jung Young Park taking on Andre Muniz. Jung Young Park is a pretty well-rounded guy. He's the favorite here. He is the favorite. Before I saw the odds, I was hoping Muniz would be the favorite, but he's not. But let me break down the guys first. John Young Park's a well-rounded fighter, very nice jab, good cage control, solid setups to his takedowns. He's pretty good everywhere. He's not really that dangerous, and I'll address the recent submission streak. He's not that dangerous, but he is pretty good. Doesn't have the knockout power, and I he is coming off three submission wins in a row. Typically, that is atypical of him. Three in a row out of 23 fights, 22 fights, great. Good for him. He's getting it done. But I don't think I could look at this guy and be like, he's a killer. But he is very good. He will grind. He will strike. He will get you to the ground. He will stay busy. And the weaker, more pathetic people in the division, he will break. And we've seen him do that. He's got good cardio. He's averaging two takedowns per fight. And he's coming off that submission win over Albert Durayev. He's taking on Andre Muniz. This guy, it, straight BJJ-wise, he's a killer. Striking is okay. His wrestling is okay. He hits pretty hard. He's got some clean striking energies. He's not going to shy away from a striking match. And he does not get desperate with his takedowns, which you do like to see. He will take real wrestling shots. And even though he avoids like the BJJ, wipe your ass on the carpet, butt scoot, I think we can still call him a BJJ nerd because he's coming off his second consecutive loss where he hit the ground and had nothing to offer. You, That's where he wants to be. Yes, it's a fist fight. Nobody wants to be on their back in a fist fight. But if anybody wanted to be there, it's him. And he just had nothing to offer in these last two fights. I mentioned every time I do my research, I break down the... I do everything and then I look at the odds. I was hoping Muniz would be a slight favorite here. I was hoping they'd be like, eh, listen... He's still a BJ. He's still a legend in the BJJ space. He's still all these things. You know, I was hoping that was going to be the case. A year ago, this guy was like a huge prospect. And that's just not who he is. It's just not who he is. He's a bit of a quitter. Doesn't have much to offer outside of pure grappling exchanges that he can control. If he gets the takedown, it's a whole different world. I don't see him taking Park down. I think Park can control the striking. I think Park can get it to the ground. I think Park wins. I think he's going to come forward, take the striking exchanges, move to the wrestling, ride out a decision, potentially even finish Muniz. Muniz, this might be a, a fall far from the top for him. Two stoppage losses. Brendan Allen's a very good loss. He should have never, ever lost to Paul Craig. He just shouldn't have. Paul Craig's a BJJ guy. Andre Muniz is supposed to be the black belt killer. That's not how that worked out. Anyway, John Young Park is the pick. Then we have Sumanerji taking on Alan Nascimento. Sumanerji is a fast striker. He's got laser accuracy, solid volume. He does not have much power, but because he's so fast and his movement is so well-timed, he can get some stoppages. He has great in-and-out style. He can out-decision most people who are not looking to take him down. Might be a problem in this matchup. He has an impressive 100% takedown accuracy. It's a little misleading, though. That's why... It is important to look at the stats. The stats matter very much, but you need to also look at all the stats. Sort of a small sample size with one single takedown in the UFC. He's coming off that loss to Matt Schnell where he dominated the striking in the second round. He robbled him more than once, but then he got tired and he got finished. He's taking on Alan Nascimento. This guy's also a pretty fun striker who likes to grapple. He doesn't have much to offer in the wrestling department, but he has no problem getting into a brawl getting a takedown, and working sweeps, submissions if he's the one that gets taken down. The problem is if he cannot get sweeps or create a scramble, he might end up on bottom and just chill there the whole fight. He does have okay power in his hands, but a low 26% takedown accuracy and a 16% takedown defense. He's coming off that upset win over Carlos Hernandez where he was fast, landed combinations, and he was just light years ahead on the ground. 
This should be a fun fight. I see Sumit Energy lighting Allen up on the feet, potentially rocking him a few times, but ultimately, I do think he's going to get taken down and controlled, potentially even submitted. The gap on the ground is far wider than the gap on the feet, and I think that's going to be Sumit Energy's biggest obstacle. Nascimento is going to be the pick, but if he doesn't wrestle, he's going to be in some trouble. I think we can trust him. I think Sue's takedown defense is just not going to be there. And Alon, Allen, Nascimento is going to get it done. But I will say that's a risky, risky play. Now we have the new co-main event of the evening. I don't know what the old one was, but this is the new one. They just put this together last week. We have Anthony Smith taking on Khalil Roundtree. Khalil Roundtree was scheduled to fight at UFC Austin. He lost his opponent. And then Anthony Smith stepped up. And uh, got himself a co-main event spot on short notice. Anthony Smith, he's a striker. He's got great hands, solid kicks. We all know he's got really good BJJ. He's got some solid submissions in his career, like over Devin Clark, Alexander Gustafson, Ryan Spann, the first time they fought a couple of years ago. He's incredibly tough, arguably too tough for his own good. When he fought Glover, I think that was during COVID, his teeth flew out of his, his teeth flew out of his mouth. An actual tooth, not a fake tooth like Dan Henderson, an actual tooth that was rooted came out and he picked them up more than one picked up those teeth handed them to the referee and then continued on with his beating he's that tough and that matters because he's not soft he has at a weird point in his career though where he's likely past his prime he's focusing on his analyst career but he can still be competitive he just beat ryan span i think he lost that fight it was a close fight but he can still be competitive he still has all the tools and uh Take it on Khalil Roundtree on short notice. I don't know if this is going to be the fight he thinks it's going to be. Khalil Roundtree is a Muay Thai striker. He's got a ton of power. He's very fast. Khalil can knock anyone out on any day as long as he's the one dictating the pace, coming forward and pushing that pressure. He fights very well going forward, backing up not as well. He does not have much offensive wrestling. He has exactly zero takedowns in 15 fights, but his takedown defense is okay. It's listed at 56%, but he can create scrambles. He does a little bit better job than that number will have you think. He is riding a four-fight win streak with the most recent one being a knockout over former heavyweight Christopher Dawkins. I mentioned Anthony Smith's career trajectory, right? I, I think that matters here. Anthony stepping up on short notice seems to be more about the money and less about pushing up the rankings. Because let's look at Wonder Boy. Right, Wonder Boy, also aging. He's a little older than Anthony Smith, but an older guy, a veteran, who is very focused on his career. When Michelle Pajeda missed weight, Wonder Boy said, I don't have much left. I can't be doing this forever. I need to take my career seriously. I cannot fight this guy after the weight miss. I can't. And that tells you that Wonder Boy, and I'm, I'm a little off topic, but I'll bring it back. That tells you that Wonder Boy cares very much about his career and is trying to become the champion of the world. Anthony Smith, yeah, I'll do it. yeah, short notice, I don't care. It's a very different mindset. It's a very different world. And we love people like Anthony Smith for stepping up on short notice. It's not typically a great career move. It did just work out for Jalen Turner. But it's not typically the way to go. And Anthony Smith at 35 is different than Jalen Turner at 20 whatever the hell. I think Anthony Smith could have some success. We know he's tough. We know he's a big guy. We know all those things. But Khalil Roundtree is not Ryan Spann. He's physically not Ryan Spann. Ryan Spann's a beast, but Ryan Spann's a little slow. Khalil Roundtree is fast. He hits hard. I think Khalil Roundtree wins this fight. I think he's a step ahead of Anthony Smith the entire time. But Anthony Smith is nuts nuts tough so this is likely a decision maybe we get lucky with a one and a half round line and we can go ahead and play the over of that but clear roundtree is going to be the pick i think he's just going to be too much for anthony smith on short notice then we have the main event of the evening it's not the most star-studded main event but this should be a really fun fight we have yudong song taking on chris gutierrez in a striker's delight Yudong Song's a technical striker. He moves really well. He's fast. He hits hard. He's insanely athletic. He can be hittable. He's getting hit at almost four significant strikes per minute. He does throw everything with power. He does leave himself open for takedowns because of that. He's got okay submission defense, but he's very good at creating space and getting back to his feet. He does like to dictate the pace, but he did show us that even when he's fighting a very good grappler like Ricky Simone, 
He'll just let his hands go, and he trusts his takedown defense, which is great because you see a lot of these guys that will fight very good wrestlers, and they're afraid to commit because they're just waiting, waiting, waiting for the takedown. That's not Yudong. Yudong will come forward. He will do what he's going to do. He will dictate that pace. He's not going to wait. And as I mentioned, he's coming off that win over Ricky Simone or Ricky, yeah, Ricky Simone. Looks like Simon, but it's Simone. He had that incredible fifth round stoppage win where he dropped him twice and almost doubled the significant strikes. Taking on Chris Gutierrez. This guy's also a very good kickboxer. He's got great low kicks, good cage control. He's got good volume at more than five significant strikes landed per minute and solid cardio where he can keep a pace. There's no secrets, right? His game plan is plot forward, light you up with leg kicks, just non-stop leg kicks, hopefully to slow you down, and then he'll throw straight punches to put you out. He's got good takedown defense at 71%, and that allows him to be loose on his feet as well. He's coming off that dominant win over Dalatang Haley, where he more than tripled the strikes. This fight likely looks exactly like Chris Gutierrez's loss to Pedro Munoz. Except maybe even worse because Song has some very real power. Chris is no slouch, and I'm not trying to minimize his skills or his ability to fight, but I do think Yadong is coming into his own. I think he's just sort of hitting his rhythm. He's 26. Think about how long he's been in the UFC and how young he is. I think he's finally starting to peak. I think these next two or three years with him are going to be incredible. He's actually going to peak, going to make something happen. I think he's going to come in here. It's his third main event. This is his third fight where he was prepared for five rounds. He did just go five rounds. This is Chris's first. I think Yudong's going to be faster. I think he's going to hit harder. I think he's going to have better cardio. I think he's going to have better wrestling. I think Yudong's song's going to be a step ahead of Chris Gutierrez this entire time. And I think he wins the fight for all of those reasons. But Chris is the type of guy that could surprise you. Look what he just did to Alatang Haley. Guys, don't forget about the one thousand dollar giveaway it is a hundred percent free to enter i know i push premium and it works we have almost three thousand premium members but this doesn't require any of that it is 100 free the only thing you need to do is click subscribe on we want picks click subscribe on the picks nation youtube channel comment on the giveaway video and we will use a random comment picker to pick the winner as long as we hit 20,000 on We Want Picks, 10,000 on Picks Nation, we will give away the money. A regular person gets $500. A premium member, we double it and we give you $1,000. The links to do all of those things are below this video. Becoming a premium member is far more than doubling your potential winnings in a giveaway. It also is going to get you tools, insight, information, and more. You're going to get the detailed data, metrics, and analytics. 38 columns of data metrics and analytics that you can use while doing your own. There are people that sell just this spreadsheet for $10. For $10 from us, you're going to get so much more. You're also going to get the line movement tracker, opening odds, current odds, win probability, and line movement for every fighter on every card. This card specifically, two people had big time flips from underdogs to favorites. You're also going to get the DraftKings optimizer. This will build 150 lineups for you for your DraftKings fantasy league. And you're going to get far more than just one analyst. This isn't one person giving you a Patreon with five bets on it. That sucks. You paid some guy for a Patreon with five bets on it and that's it? Your entire, everything relies on this dude's couple of bets. Cannot have it. You're going to get tools, information, insight, and I think we're seven analysts at this point. We got the MMA Minute giving you picks, bets, round line leans, method, and so much more. He's got 30,000 followers on Tiki Taki. You're going to get Running Mouth MMA. Three of them giving you their picks, their bets, their round line leans, their confidence plays. You're going to get Artem breaking down far more than just UFC. He's going to give you PFL, LFA, Bellator, all of those picks, bets, insight. And you're going to get the pick doctor. He has developed an AI. We have an AI picking fights based solely off of data. I think over the last five cards or three, whatever the hell it is, I think it's well above 70%. I could be wrong, but click on pick doctor in the analyst menu and all the historical data is right there ready for you. Follow the socials. So first, premium member. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's only freaking $10. Then do all the free things. Follow the socials. Guys, thank you so much. Like, subscribe. We appreciate every single one of you. Become a premium member. If you're not a premium member, just thanks for the watch. Thanks for the like and good luck.